Good afternoon, and uh, thank you all for coming. It's my turn, and uh, I'm going to continue what I did this morning by uh, what we call uh, have a celebration of a bonfire of IPCC. <laughs> it's still gangster signs. It doesn't go nowhere. And of course, all of you express on my own again, and uh, should be yours too. <laughs> perspective, perspective. I mean, I'm really grateful for the two gentlemen for presenting the result very clearly. To tell you that the sun is big, the earth is really small. This is actually a true uh, scale in that sense. That is about 1 to 120, 119. So, to later I'll of course explain in a much more layman language, so please watch out that uh, I'm going to put uh, Larry on the cable guy, which I was not able to show before, and it will be at the end of this talk. So now I'm just going to tackle two problems of IPCC report in terms of the issue of sun climate, strictly only on that topic, because I really got a huge amount of headache just reading some of these 10 pages. So now I will talk about the key physics and the issue of absolute calibration of this thing, what they call solar constant, or the total solar irradiance. It's a huge problem. And then I'll talk about zero expertise in the study of uh, solar type stars, which means we need some astronomer around. It's terrible that how IPCC is misrepresenting results and uh, I guess misleading everyone, including themselves. The first one is this sort of a seemingly naive statement that the IPCC claim on that particular page on chapter 8 that, oh, it's only a few tenths of a percent bias in the absolute TSI value, so it will have minimal consequences for climate simulation. This is a kind of typical googly duke that is very anti-scientific, I would say, because it neither raised to the level of truth, because there's a lot of problem that's been hidden that they purposely chosen to not kind of explain the fact, because, you know, hey, you folks are pretty much just like me, I'm pretty much dumb not so smart, you know, I want them to be able to understand this topic. But it's terrible if you want to explain science to people in a real way. So let's start with the measurements that is available of this thing called the total solar irradiance. We have put up satellite instrument on top of the space. By the way, we, we cannot stay down here because too much of the clouds and all these other problems. So we realized that since the 60s and 70s, right, that we need to put satellite instrument. It's a cavity radiometer. You put it up there, you're trying to determine the le level of the total solar irradiance. Here is a collection of 12 values jumping all over the place. They're different instruments. And this is a value of uh, government-funded science, if I may say so, because it seems to be a lot of free money floating around. Nobody make any attempt to try to tell me. Where is the exact absolute value? They say it's not important, right, IPCC? I'll demonstrate to you how important that number is, because it allows the climate modeler and all those guys to adjust their climatology, which is really a huge consequence. And then, of course, you talk about how much does it change. This is one way in which that they try to glue all these different instruments together. In fact, according to Folk's Law, this is the, the definition. Because they claim now they have decided that with some new instrument they built in Boulder, there's a facility, they're going to calibrate everything down to about 1361 level. And I say, who says that? Show me the data. The point is that this problem has plagued us for a very long time. As you can see, you have a set of this measurement. I can point to at least a slightly, I would consider, superior measurement, which is a project done by the Belgium. They put it on an international space station, but with a larger aperture of this pinhole, cavity radiometer. The problem has always been that we don't know enough of that to calibrate against all this other stuff. But now you have a very precise hole, because the hole is bigger now. And that measurement doesn't tell us that it's 1361. It's still at about 1364. Okay? That already gives you, hey, you got to think about it. I mean, I don't think this is settled science at all. By the way, they say this is definitively settled science. I disagree strongly, humbly. And here's another way to look at it now. I just thought that another paper shows that all these different values. This is the, the Belgium group, the Royal Meteorological Institute of uh, Belgium. Uh, 14 of them, the values. Just to try to tell you that there are different groups studying such things. And it's fairly important, actually. It's just that they want to simply put up the same kind of instrumentation over and over again, doing the same old thing without solving the problem, which is really an embarrassment for solar physics. If you call yourself a solar physicist, this is a problem of the community. And to tell you about things like why this thing is so important, why is it the absolute level is so important, just look at paper like this, which means the climate modeler that don't tell you. Okay? 
Look at, look at what happened to the value of the global temperature of the ocean. If you put in exactly, let's say, 1360, the value of the solar constant, you get a value of the Earth, global temperature. If you include the land, it's 38 degrees Celsius. If you put just the sea surface, it's 35 degrees Celsius. You overheat the system. Okay? You all know where the average temperature is for the global Earth. It's about 15 to 14 degrees or so. Even that is not very well determined. So it, sh it shows you now, you can... So, guess what happened? What, what are they supposed to put in uh, in terms of the climate model? What value? 1360? No, it's going to overheat the, uh, the, the system. So they actually put it as much lower, almost 90 or, or 100 watts lower than it's actually being measured in the climate model. So you already consider how serious this problem is. Again, I consider this to be a problem with the solar physicist, but it's also a problem for the climate modeler. And here, to put a concrete example, here's a run of the climate model from the NASA Goddard Institute for Space Study, led by formerly by Jim Hansen, and then, of course, now by Gavin Schmidt. I'll show you what he says later. This is a run of the model with, let's say, they say, wow, we got atmosphere. We got how many layers of the ocean? We run it, and then, you know, no forcing. This one, no nothing. Just let it run to equilibration. You just look at the, the free run. I mean, the amplitude is pretty large. 4,000 years of run without climate forcing. By the way, I, Willis Aschenbach, my friend, is not here, who keeps saying that we can't find 11 years. Look at the climate model. They produce 11-year cycles. But, of course, it's artificially imposed. It's a terrible thing that these people are playing with the model that, that way. But at least you can find some kind of discussion around. And video, please. This is what uh, our good friend, the new leader of uh, NASA Goddard Institute for Space Study, the new director. The models are say. skillful, not just in the global mean, but also in the regional patterns. I could go through a dozen more examples. A the dozen. skill associated with solar cycles, changing the ozone in the stratosphere. Skill associated with orbital changes over 6,000 years. We can look at that too, and the models are skillful. The models are skillful in response to the ice sheets 20,000 years ago. The Amazing. models are skillful when it comes to the 20th century trends over the decades. Models are successful at modeling lake outbursts into the North Atlantic 8,000 years ago, and we can get a good match to the data. Okay. Let's test. I'm very bothered by that sort of arrogance. A simple problem. You all heard that the 6,000 years, they know how to do it? Let's look at China. How look at 36 climate models in what they call the Paleo Climate Project to talk about the mid-Holocene climate ottoman temperature, which is about 6,000 years ago. Just to show you that their model is uh, very, very good. Hey, they're able to get more or less similar temperature according to what the current temperature compared to what is uh, deduced from, uh, you know, observation. More or less okay, you know, kind of nice. What about 6,000 years ago? Here's the result. If you ask yourself, what happened to the annual mean temperature? All 35 models out of 36, only one saying that it's warmer during the, for the annual mean temperature. But for all the winter temperature, all 36 out of 36, which is 100%, I don't think you can go higher than that, all got it wrong. But let's ask ourselves, how warm is the mid-Holocene uh, winter temperature in China? It's 5 to 8 degrees warmer. The only reason why they, got, they couldn't get that is because winter insulation of mid-Holocene actually is decreasing in trend. So the model is just slave to this input radiation. And then they always claim, they always claim, the one that Gavin Schmidt said that they can do this, they talk about the summer temperature. It's, it's warmer, it's produced warmer. But at the same time, of course, it's hidden that the winter temperature is all completely wrong. So I don't think that would result to be anywhere near valid, and I wouldn't even go out there and tell people climate model can do this and that. So let me move on. And the worst thing is that the folks that produced that paper, da, doc, the chief author is Dr. Da Bang Jiang. He's actually an expert reviewer of that. And you want to find where the result is in the IPCC AR5 report? No way you're going to find it. Too bad. And then, of course, the bogus result from AR5, trying to talk about mid-Holocene uh, climate change, that how good their model is. But notice that there's no data in China. How can I produce a paper where I have to just show you that's how wrong it is? I don't know what's wrong with what's going on in IPCC expert review. Somehow they don't want to talk about China. It's terrible. And then tropic, of course, I call it bogus too. There's just not much data in the, in the tropics. 
Again, this is the way the Sun will repay IPCC when they issue the summary for policymaker without the full report. Okay, on September 27, that's how the sun looked like. It's smiling a little bit. Maybe the sun does have a sense of humor. Just don't throw CO2 in it. And then I'm very bothered by a statement like this. Essentially, IPCC is making some sort of a pseudo-scientific claim that some of the old work based on Balunas and Jastro. Oh, sorry, there's a typo. Balunas was my former colleague. Jastro was actually the creator and the director, first director of NASA GIS. And uh, they produce papers, and we've been studying sun-like stuff for almost uh, 50 years now. Not myself, of course, I'm doing it for 25 years. But they started earlier, and saying that all their result was flaw. That's a very strong words, by the way. And citing some of our own colleagues. This is just a matter of really amazing injustice in that sense, because I'm standing up here to defend the work of Balunas and Jastro. Not because I like them, it's just that their work are reasonable. These people are misrepresenting what the result is. Let me show you. This is some of our work of trying to measure not only the magnetic activity of the sun, but we're studying a group of sun-like stars. So about 300 of them in this sample, we measure not only the magnetic variability, we're also measuring the light output changes, which is very, very small, so it's a hard detection, but we're measuring a lot of them. And I show you the 1% changes level, which is quite large. And this is how the activity versus time measure by the way, one of the criticisms was based on one single measurement, the right at all paper, the 2004. We have been monitoring this thing continuously for 30 years, you know, 50 years, and we study this variability. Those guys are measuring a single point, and they say that they can debunk a work of our quality. So quality is very important. And here's a way that uh, another star, sun-like star, that have exact almost similar kind of uh, activity versus the brightness variation. And here the detection is very good, it's 0.15%, just like what our sun is doing now. Now I quickly jump to this high-speed uh, uh, study of astronomy, which is really fascinating. So from one yellow star, we can actually go up to 42,000 star now. This is just because of CCD technology. That we're able to do things like this. This is based on the NASA Kepler mission. I belong to the counter proposal because we have another mission that we lost the proposal because these guys have better science. So they win, it's fine. I'm not embarrassed to say that. Here's what they do the Kepler mission. They actually propose to have a satellite up and they stay in a particular region of the Milky Way and then look at a particular star field and then have very, very high sensitive detecting changes of the the changes of the light output is one part in 100,000, so it's a very high precision measurement. In fact, a fun picture to see is that, see if any of you guys can find the star field of the Kepler mission in this picture of a night sky of Tokyo, Japan. It's actually hidden there. And here's the result. This is new result. I don't belong to that group, but it's published by these folks, Gibor Basri et al. at UC Berkeley. And here's all the data. And then just to give you a quick answer is that here's a statistical distribution of the changes that they've been monitoring for close to 100. This one here is about 1,000 stars, this sample, because now you restrict your sample to a very narrow sun-like star. I want to alert you that the sun sample statistical distribution of the variability, on the low end, even the slight disagreement is because the, our, the Kepler measurement is not sensitive enough. So the low end it doesn't count in the sense that we couldn't detect that low variability. But on the high end, you can see there's a lot more highly active sample in the uh, Kepler star. What this tells you is that the sun is completely capable of a lot more larger uh, changes. And here's what they say, that they have found that there's a lot of this active star, close to 20 to 33% of those. And then they imply that the sun have a normal activity, so the sun is not unusual in that sense, because those guys are claiming that we are wrong because you know, the sun is just very unusual star compared to any other stars in the universe, except for the concept of sun-like star is wrong, which is, of course, proven beyond doubt now that it's more correct than what they say. So that's the end of it. And just want to remind us that you have the green team that's very, very dark. We have our nitpick uh, red team that we're doing our best to try to follow the procedure of science. And I believe that now you really will be my be Will you talk about how any worse than what we, we got? Couldn't, we, could, we couldn't, right? It's pretty bad. All right, so you talk about Al Gore and global warming. <laughs> oh, gee. Yeah, i got to be honest with you. Global mm -hmm. warming. That's what a farce that's turned out to be. And I was just up in Canada. Yeah. Global warming. You know, I had a polar bear beg me to shoot it in the head. It was so cold up there. <laughs> I'm not kidding. Anyway, that's what I told the cops.
but uh, no, global warming in this Al Gore. I mean, you know, he's always like the CO2 level. It's like, come on, Al. I don't know what the CO2 level is, but the BS level is getting pretty high. I know that. Much. And have you seen him lately? Global warming hasn't melted his ice cream any. Good night. He's blowing up like a tick on Dracula. Al Gore is. He needs to sweat a little bit. Well, who do you? Who do you? And, and here's another thing. They discount. Nobody ever says anything about the sun. Yeah. It's our fault they got global warming, mm -hmm. but they discount the sun. Blame you the know? sun? Yeah. I mean, you got this big ball of fire in the sky, but yeah, that has nothing to do with it. It's humans that are doing it. You know, right. that's like sitting at a bonfire and somebody lighting a cigarette and somebody else going, put out that cigarette, it's getting hot in here. <laughs> you know what I mean? It <laughs> doesn't make any sense. It makes no sense. And Alvin, how did all Thank the you. ice melt, Sean? We've had, what, four ice ages yeah. alone? Four. Once the whole world was covered in ice? Yeah. I mean, was the dinosaurs driving SUVs and stuff no, around back then? I don't think it so. It makes no sense. It doesn't. What do you just?